Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2018 State of the County Address, hosted by the El Paso Chamber. Please rise for the presentation of colors by the El Paso County Sheriff's Office Honor Guard and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance and the singing of our national anthem. To perform the national anthem is public policy analyst for County Commissioner Carlos Leon, Ms. Josie Castro, her sister, Officer Cristina Castro with the El Paso Police Department, and Assistant County Attorney Erica Rosales. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
El Paso County's foundation is strong, our team committed, and our agenda ambitious. Please turn your attention to the screens for a brief video. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President and CEO of the El Paso Chamber, David Jerome. Mr. Jerome became President and CEO of the El Paso Chamber in January of 2018. Previous to that, his career saw him in South Korea running General Motors operations, in Brussels with InBev, and in London with International Hotel Group. He is proud to now call himself an El Pasoan. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please, um, on behalf of the El Paso Chamber community, our members, our, uh, our staff, and of, of course, our sponsors, let me welcome you to the State of the City. Uh, pardon me, State of the County. I apologize, Ruben. I <laughs> saw the mayor there. <laughs> but I will say this real quick is, you know, one of the things I really love about this job is the really, truly wonderful people I get to meet and our speaker that we have today is no exception to that rule. And this is one thing that I feel very strongly for the chamber is one of the key deliverables that we have for you. As members of the chamber, we want to make sure you have a chance to network with each other, like events like today. And we also want to make sure that we have the opportunity for you to meet folks, like individuals like our speaker today. And I think today you will not be disappointed. I know we have a great speech lined up for you here. And with that, let me just say, I have absolute confidence you're gonna enjoy this, this day and thank you so much for being here, thank you. To introduce today's speaker is Dr. Richard Bineda. 
Dr. Pineda is the director of the Sam Donaldson Center for Communication Studies at the University of Texas at El Paso. He is easily one of the most recognizable commentators on politics in the borderland for his political acumen along with his colorful bow ties and lively socks. He has partnered with El Paso Chamber on events like Pines in Politics and Leadership El Paso. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Richard Pineda. It is my distinct honor to be here with you this afternoon to introduce our speaker. I've been a faculty member at the University of Texas at El Paso for 15 years, and in that time, I've been fortunate enough to cross path, paths with a great number of outstanding students. Early in those 15 years, I met one of the most articulate, intellectually advanced students I've interacted with at UTEP. Someone with a keen sense of purpose, and even as a college student, someone with a powerful sense of social activism and justice. For those of you lucky enough to have worked with or have been inspired by our county judge, Ruben Vogt, you know the qualities I speak of have only grown in intensity and with passion. It'd be easy to talk about Judge Vogt's journey from Canutillo to the county judge's office. His academic pedigree and political accomplishments speak volumes about him. But in a moment like this, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Ruben Vogt, the amazing and outstanding human being that I am proud to call my county judge. In a time we were witnessing unprecedented political and social incivility, Judge Vogt stands as a luminary example of someone focused on building rather than tearing down, focused on dialogue rather than disagreement, and focused on sharing his kindness and humanity with everyone that he can. Before I go further, I want to acknowledge two special guests that are here with us this afternoon, the judge's parents, Ruben and Hortensia Vogt. As a professor, As a professor, I love the opportunity to thank parents, and today is no difference. To you, Mr. and Mrs. Vogt, I thank you on behalf of a grateful county for raising a remarkable young man whose soul and passion speak not only to the lessons that he learned from you, but to the example that you set every day of his life. Thank you so much, and thank you for sharing him with us all. An undergraduate and graduate degree holder from UTEP, Judge Vogt distinguished himself with his service as a student, and among many other recognitions and honors, was, was awarded a prestigious Truman Scholarship. Truman Scholars are recognized for their commitment to service, and the judge is forever on a list of luminaries that include Janet Napolitano, current president of the University of California system, Bill de Blasio, mayor of New York City, George Stephanopoulos, and former ambassador and national security advisor Susan Rice. His work on Synergy, a youth engagement project he designed and ran while he was at UTEP, led my colleague, the esteemed Kathy Stout, to say this about Ruben. People like Ruben Vogt exemplify the best of El Paso leaders who together with others strengthen talent border voices in our larger society. She added, I've always been impressed with Vogt's professionalism coupled with enthusiasm for the El Paso region. As a policy analyst for then Senator Elliot Shapley, Judge Vogt worked, uh, worked intimately on drafting and strategizing legislation. From that position, he was tapped by then Commissioner Veronica Escobar for his expertise in legislation and policy and served as County Judge Escobar's Chief of Staff until he was selected by the Commissioner's Court to serve in his current position as County Judge. Over the course of the last year, Judge Vogt has led a Commissioner's Court focused on improving the financial stability of the county and working to maintain a trajectory of positive accomplishment for the county. In addition to his role as County Judge, Ruben is Vice Chair of Equality Texas whose mission is to secure full equality for LGBTQ Texans through education, community organizing, and collaboration. While the judge has downplayed his role as one of the first gay county judges in Texas, it's important to recognize that his efforts, both in El Paso and in the state, are emblematic not only of someone committed to diversity and equality, but they speak to the humanity that makes Ruben vote so special. He's an activist for all Pasoans, but recognizes that his role in this world is to fight to ensure dignity and to support those that are marginalized among us. It is my pleasure, and indeed my honor, to welcome to the stage a tireless advocate for our community, a visionary trailblazer, my friend, our county judge, the Honorable Reuben John Vogt. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm sure that all of you are enjoying your salad, but as mentioned by Christy Doherty with Emergence Health Network, she said, if Peter Piper is a star sponsor, why aren't we having the best pizza in town for lunch today? 
I would have to agree with you, Christy. So thank you to Peter Piper for being here today and for the fantastic food you serve El Pasoans all the time. Thank you so much, Dr. Pineda, for the incredibly kind introduction. I wish we could start every commissioner's court meeting with something like that. I don't know if the commissioner's court would be okay with it, but thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank the El Paso Chamber for providing us, the county, this platform to share with you the incredible work that is going on within your El Paso County government. Now, before we get started, I'd like to recognize a few people that are here today, and if you'd please hold your applause until they've all been recognized. First, I'd like to acknowledge our first responders, law enforcement, and fearless military personnel, and our veterans and military, again, who have and continue to serve in harm's way to advance safety and freedom for us all. I'd also like to recognize, as Dr. Pineda mentioned, my parents, Ruben and Hortensia Vogt, and my in-laws, Carlos and Rachel Martinez. I'm sure my parents are see sitting here looking on with incredible pride, but they have no idea the tremendous pride I have to call them my parents for all they've done and all they've sacrificed to have me stand up here today. I'd also like to thank, thank you. I'd also like to thank the 58 elected officials, 20 department heads, and the over 3,000 employees that make up El Paso County. And a part of that team are four fantastic county commissioners whom I have the honor of serving with. Without their confidence, I wouldn't have the tremendous opportunity of serving in this role. Because as all of you know, I was appointed to fill an unexpired term. And quite frankly, if you're gonna serve in public office, I think this might be the way to go. So. <laughs> Commissioner Haggerty is a staunch advocate for and a willing volunteer at the, community, at the county cleanups that we have every year. He keeps his finger on the pulse of his precincts by holding weekly community meetings. And for those of you that have community meetings, that is a huge undertaking. County Commissioner David Stout ensures that we remember the importance of our unique location by advocating for the creation of a bi-national roundtable and his work to preserve our community's rich history. County Commissioner Carlos Leon is always in search of modernizing our services, like our new payment kiosks at our annexes and his successful advocacy for raising the county's minimum wage for our employees this year to $12 is just one example of what he's doing to ensure that El Paso County remains competitive. County Commissioner Vince Perez is a strong advocate for addressing the critical needs in the county's unincorporated areas, and his office's initial research sparked the dialogue to begin evaluating ways in which we could reform our local criminal justice system. Thank you to Betsy Keller, our Chief Administrator, who brings tremendous heart and talent to the organization. And she masterfully navigates strong personalities, like mine, with grace and grit. So thank you, Betsy. To Nicole and Celeste in the County Judge's Office, they're backstage working right now, unfortunately. There's no way that the County Judge's Office would be able to function without you. Your commitment to this organization and our community is unmatched. There's no way that I could have gotten through the last year without you. We did it. And finally, the honor and the privilege to serve in this role would not have been possible, and to serve the county would not have been possible had it not been for a fierce Latina who set her sight on fighting corruption, creating reform, and changing the course of county government. And while she didn't do it alone, she was definitely the impetus to getting it started. A big thank you to someone I have tremendous respect and gratitude for, former El Paso County Judge Veronica Escobar. Please help me in thanking them all for the incredible they, work they do for El Paso County. Let me express my deepest gratitude for the privilege of addressing you today. Each of you is tirelessly providing services in your realm to advance opportunity. And despite the various obstacles that we all face in the work that we do, it's a labor of love for El Paso. But that's the story of El Paso, isn't it? The unlikely community and her people rising to the occasion and guiding us beyond what could be imagined. We are a resilient El Paso, and so too is the story of your county government. Each one of you has come to expect more from your county government, to be a source of pride, to be a responsible, inclusive government, and one that has set a bold agenda for our community. 
Bold is our progressive county that, that has created a culture that no longer accepts the status quo. Bold is our ambitious county that understands that success doesn't happen on its own, but requires us to think bigger and more long-term because we deserve it. And bold is our inclusive county that embraces our community's rich diversity. Whether a veteran, a single mother, a member of the LGBTQ community, wealthy, poor, or regardless of your immigration status, we may all be different, but we are all connected. It is that inclusivity that affords me the incredible opportunity to stand before you today and proudly introduce to you my husband, Carlos Martinez. Now, it hasn't always been that way. I started with the organization 11 years ago on the heels of an FBI raid that we all remember. And at that time, we were asking ourselves, how did we get here as a community? Reform has taken time, but I'm humbled to stand here today as your county judge and share with you the role that your county government is playing in advancing that bold vision through a renewed strategy around economic development, a focus on modern quality of life amenities, greater access to quality health care, an aggressive transportation agenda, and serving as a model around criminal justice reform. But we haven't done it alone. It's our collective efforts that allows me to confidently proclaim that the state of our county government is stronger than ever before. And I'm proud to report that we are a financially sound government with a healthy fund balance, a strong bond rating, and one of the least indebted counties in the state. On August 27th, your commissioner's court approved a $426.3 million balanced budget. Our budget reflects the critical services that residents rely on us for. Services like public safety, maintaining roads, court services, and transportation are just a glimpse of what has to operate on a very limited budget. And despite all this, El Paso County only makes up 15% of your tax bill. On the screen is a breakdown as to where your taxes go on any given year. And much of our success lies in finding ways to maximize our financial position. For example, in December of 2017, we took advantage of an opportunity to refinance over $50 million of our bonds. This allowed the county to save each one of us over 10% on future debt payment, which amounted to $5.6 million in interest savings over the next 14 years. And that's just one example. It's a culmination of past and present decisions that has led to our ability to maintain a steady tax rate. For the last four years, El Paso County has not raised your taxes. Let me repeat that. For the last four years, El Paso County has not raised your taxes. Not only have we gone three years in a row without raising your taxes, but this year we adopted a lower overall tax rate. Now it's rare to have a taxing entity be able to go four years in a row without raising your taxes, especially when trying to urbanize services in the county where a majority of our community's growth is occurring. In fact, since 2010, zip codes in the unincorporated parts of the county have grown by 131%. And that's huge. And we've been able to keep up with that growth while still being financially responsible. Now, something that we are all cognizant of and that we're all working toward addressing is the unfortunate reality that homeowners make up a bulk of our local tax base as opposed to other communities where commercial properties make up a much larger share. Changing this requires an aggressive economic development strategy. And as all of you know, for far too long, we've been classified as a low-wage community where jobs that were incentivized were good, but they weren't building a niche for our community, and talent was fleeting. El Paso County recognized this cycle and understood that in order to change it, we'd have to play a much larger role. To address this, in 2016, El Paso County created an economic development department that would work to attract and expand the most desirable kinds of businesses. Those that are quality job creators, those that are making advancements within their industry, and those that have the capacity to revitalize neighborhoods. 
This year, the commissioner's court-approved policies aimed at providing thoughtful and deliberate incentives, and not simply offering subsidies or corporate welfare, which none of us wants. Over the last several years, El Paso County has been a partner in providing incentives to 21 diverse companies, which have invested $519 million right here in our community, and with that, created over 2,900 new jobs. But despite these incentives, we found ourselves falling short in what is an incredibly competitive climate to attract businesses. Doing nothing meant that we would never be able to compete at the highest levels. So this year, your commissioner's court, for the first time, made a strategic investment of $3 million to start an economic development impact fund. The fund, which will grow over time with additional allocations, serves as yet another tool that will allow us to provide upfront capital to address a business's initial needs. It's a smart decision that will help us move away from relying so heavily on sales and property tax incentives and makes El Paso more competitive. Now, for far too long, we've heard about El Paso's brain drain problem. We at the county want to be a part of shaping the story of our brain gain. I'm extremely excited to update you on a critical collaboration that is expanding our community's economic and educational portfolio. 24 months ago, we launched an ambitious partnership with UTEP to turn the county's underutilized and dilapidated 400-acre airport in Fabens into UTEP's technology research innovation and uh, acceleration park, which is an expansion of UTEP Center for Space Exploration and Technology Research. The intent was to establish an economic engine that would attract aerospace, defense, and government entities right here in our backyard. And it has performed just as we intended, if not better. To date, and I'm sure some of you may not even know about the great work happening out in Fabens, to date, UTEP and the county have renovated the hangar, which is now being used as an aerospace integration facility. Phase one construction of a 13-acre site has been completed and includes site development, roads, electricity, and three test cells. Phase two is set to begin this December and will include the development of two more test cells and a flight wind tunnel facility. The collaboration has gained interest from federal agencies, resulting in UTEP being awarded 6.5 million dollars in new research and capacity building grants and contracts. And given the partnership's success, UTEP has expanded its efforts. This year, they've established a new test site in Tornillo for their unmanned aerial systems or drone research and education program. They've also established a partnership with Horizon City and TMD Defense and Space to launch a missile and hypersonic weapons research and education program. The facility will serve as a small business incubator for aerospace and defense. And again, it's something that we probably could never imagine would happen in our backyard. But on top of that, NASA has also provided funding to expand UTEP's K through 12 STEM programs in Fabens, Clint, San Elizario, and the Isleta del Sur Pueblo. To date, the Fabens site supports the research and education of 30 UTEP graduates and undergraduate students. With the facility expansion in Horizon City and Tornillo, that number is projected to increase to 80 by the end of next year, and after completion of phase two construction, more than 150 students will be taking wind tunnel laboratory courses at the Fabens facility every year. Now, we're incredibly proud of this partnership with UTEP. It's gonna help create higher paying jobs, keep our local talent here at home, and promotes El Paso as a premier site for defense and aerospace research and technology development. I'd like to take this time to thank Dr. Diana Natalicio and Dr. Hassan Shadouri for believing in El Paso County and being willing partners to roll up their sleeves and work with us. This is a prime example of what can get done when we work together. And we still have significant work to do, but the county's role in economic development has come a long way in a very short amount of time. Now, our ability to attract businesses, advocate for expansion of our region's three military installations, and to simply address the needs of a growing community means having the right transportation infrastructure in place that can sustain us heading into the future. El Paso County is working to meet the challenges of this growth head on. You can't miss all the construction going on. Orange cones, cranes, and work crews can be spotted all over El Paso along with the angry Facebook and Twitter posts about traffic. 
Let's take a look at two of those posts now. This gentleman asked the question that was on everyone's mind. How are we supposed to get to the Cincy bars if I-10 is closed? Hashtag asking for a friend. Or this tweet that projected total gloom. El Paso is canceled. I-10 closed for the next 12 years, so take Paisano. No, no, don't. The water main break at Paisano. I'm slowly waiting for some sort of closure of Montana, because, I mean, why not? Then, of course, Hawkins forever closed. <laughs> You've got to love El Paso, man. Expansion is a must, and with that comes the detours and the inconvenience. But there's more to that story. You may remember from previous State of the County addresses that in 2013, the county for the first time ever put together a comprehensive mobility plan to help expedite 15 major projects that had to occur but weren't slated to happen for many years. It was through an increase to our vehicle registration fee that spurred over $400 million worth of transportation projects in our region, an unprecedented amount. As you can imagine, this was a tremendous undertaking for the county. But in collaboration with our various municipalities, our state delegation, former Texas Transportation Commission Chairman Ted Houghton, TxDOT, and the Camino Real Regional Mobility Authority, we've been able to aggressively address the transportation needs of our growing community. And we've delivered on our promise. In 2018, we've completed work on three of those projects, which totaled $38 million. And in the next two years, work will begin on two additional projects. In total, nine of the 15 projects have been completed, and all have come in at or below budget. Much thanks to the county departments, our public works department in particular, that has worked tirelessly to execute this plan. And we didn't stop there. El Paso County owns and maintains 620 miles of roadway in our county. This year, we've paved 300% more of our county roadways than in the last three years combined. And that's pretty impressive, especially given what I mentioned earlier, that zip codes in the county are growing by how much? Anybody? 131%. Thank you, Alexis. You get free backstage tickets to see Khalid. Please see the mayor after the speech. He'll hook you up with that. <laughs> and that's historic growth. That doesn't take into account current and future growth. Now, public transit is necessary for many to get to work, access to health care, school, and entertainment. However, the minute you set foot into the county, public transportation is lacking. Individuals must stand alongside roadways with no seating or shade and hail down the county's transit provider. In an effort to move toward a more modern system, we're working with the Texas Transportation Institute and local partners to create a regional transit so that constituents are afforded more seamless transportation, as opposed to having to shift from one transportation service to another with varying rates and unmarked pickup locations. Nobody wants to go through that kind of transportation system. Now let's make no mistake about it. Reliable transportation is needed in getting to and from our quality of life amenities. Now, the concept of quality of life usually elicits the idea of what residents do on their down, downtime, out of school and out of work. However, to El Paso County, it means addressing severe disparities in day-to-day -day services in addition to supporting quality public spaces for our community to enjoy. For example, if you live in the city of El Paso, you have the luxury of modern amenities like water and wastewater services. That doesn't stand true in parts of El Paso County where thousands of residents continue to live without these basic services. And quite frankly, it's unacceptable. Over the last several years, your county has worked in collaboration with federal and state agencies to draw down tens of millions of dollars to help provide connectivity. And just as important is providing stormwater infrastructure for those living outside the city limits. And this is literally a $150 million problem that we're working to address in collaboration with our smaller municipalities and El Paso Water. This year, we've purchased additional equipment and are updating our stormwater master plan, which will provide us a strategic roadmap for addressing this issue. And unlike the city of El Paso, counties do not have the ability to create a stormwater fee. To help, though, over the last two budget cycles, the court has allocated nearly $7.5 million to further this effort. The need is tremendous. The cost is high, 
But these are perhaps two of the most important things that we must continue to work towards addressing. Now, for those of you that may not be aware, El Paso County has 12 parks in its inventory. This includes the popular Escarate Park, which houses the only lake in the city and our community's oldest golf course, a sports park, which this year had over 260,000 visitors, and our rural parks, which provide needed green space for our unincorporated areas. Over the last 11 years, we've invested over $20 million into our park system. This year, using savings of $750,000 from our 2007 bonds, we were able to make additional investments in three of our parks that will add new fields, added green space to host festivals, and in collaboration with Tornillo Independent School District, create Tornillo's first community park. But work on our parks doesn't stop there. Moms on board, I see Adrian here, Layla, you're here as well. A local nonprofit whose members we lovingly refer to as mobsters initially asked us to evaluate use of land at Escarate Park to create an all-inclusive, wheelchair-friendly playground designed to adapt to every child's cognitive and physical needs. And one valuable lesson I've learned over time, especially in this role, is that you never cross a determined mama bear. So, not only did we listen, but we took it a step further in working towards also bringing the same amenities to Gallegos Park on the west side and Reisinger Park on the east side. We've applied for a grant to help make this happen. We're also providing in-kind contributions, and Moms on Board is helping raise a portion of the necessary funds. So if you're not a part of their Facebook group, please join them, and please attend their fundraisers, because this is an incredible project that needs to come to fruition. We're also bringing the family-friendly atmosphere to the workplace. This year, the county was designated as a mother-friendly worksite by the Texas Department of State Health Services, ensuring that we provide the best location for mothers to work and those who are visiting our facilities. Thank you to our Human Resources Department for leading this incredible effort. Now, outdoor activity is an important facet of any community, and this year, El Paso County, in partnership with developers, has created close to 40 miles of new hike and bike trails. And speaking about trails, El Paso County has also been leading a conversation around an exciting project to create a county-wide trail that would take walkers, runners, and bikers from one end of the county to the other. The Paso del Norte Health Foundation took a keen interest and as such has developed the Paso del Norte Trail. It will span 60 miles from far east to far west and take outdoor enthusiasts onto waterways, historic trails, through neighborhoods, existing green space, and through El Paso's ecological treasures. Thank you to Tracy Yellen and the team at the Paso del Norte Health Foundation for their incredible partnership and in putting the wheels in motion to make this incredible concept a reality. Now, quality of life also means a healthy community, and we're proud of the work being done at University Medical Center and El Paso Children's Hospital. These are two of our most important assets. They are our community hospitals. And I have to tell you, the impact that they have is impressive. Volumes are up at both hospitals, and they continue to expand and improve quality care and accessibility. Two of the three proposed clinics have been built, and land is being cleared to make way for the third in central El Paso. Patient volumes at both clinics continue to rise, in fact, in one year alone, both clinics saw a combined increase of over 50%. And as UMC continues its efforts to bring healthcare closer to home, it's also expanding its medical services to meet critical needs in our community. This year, UMC became the first and only hospital in El Paso to be designated as a level one comprehensive stroke center by the Joint Commission. In addition, they're now the first hospital in Texas to use brain scope technology which can detect concussions resulting from sports injuries and other impacts. They're also leading our community in 3D imaging systems that can detect cysts and tumors associated with breast cancer 40% sooner than traditional systems. A huge thank you is owed to Jacob Sintron and his leadership team for their continued work to improve one of El Paso's most critical assets. I'd also like to thank UMC's board of managers a volunteer board made up of committed El Pasoans who understand the significance UMC plays in healthcare and the role they play as the region's largest teaching hospital. And none of this could have been possible without the dedicated doctors, nurses, and staff who literally save lives every day. In fact, I owe my father sitting here today to the tremendous and extraordinary commitment they have to their patients. 
And right next door to UMC is our El Paso Children's Hospital, where this year alone, 42,000 of our littlest warriors have been seen. And get this, prior to children's opening, 650 children left El Paso every year to get the treatment that they needed. Children's has reduced that by 80% and is working to close the gap on the remaining 20. I'd like to share with you the story of one of those warriors. This is Andrea. At four years old, after a routine eye exam, her doctor sent her to a specialist after finding swollen nerves. The specialist was Dr. David Yates, medical director of the Cranial Facial Clinic at El Paso Children's. A CT scan found that Andrea had craniosynstosis, a birth defect in which one or more of the fibrous joints between the bones of a baby's skull close prematurely before the brain is fully formed. Dr. Yates had to deliver the news that no parent ever wants to hear, that your child needs immediate surgery to not only save her vision, but perhaps her life. Not only was the surgery performed at El Paso Children successful, but Andrea is stronger than ever before. She is now five and enjoying her kindergarten class and aspires to be a mariachi singer. Isn't she absolutely beautiful? I think a picture is about to pop up on the screen. You have to wait because this is actually a phenomenal picture of Andrea. Okay, we may not have it. We'll email it to you. <laughs> Andrea's story is one of 260 others who have benefited from the Cranial and Facial Clinic since it opened a year ago. And the specialized care doesn't stop there. El Paso Children's is one of only eight Cranial Facial Fellowships in the country. The only certified children's oncology group able to enroll patients into clinical trials they have the only pediatric intensive care unit with 24-7 specialist coverage, and they are one of only two local hospitals to have a NICU level four designation. Now the turnaround we're starting to see didn't happen on its own. Just over a year ago, Cindy Stout was selected to serve as El Paso Children's CEO, and let me tell you, she has hit the ground running. She's responsible for significant gains, like renegotiating contracts with our managed care organizations, which this year alone will yield an additional $12 million in revenue that we were seeing leave this community every year. That's huge. We were bleeding that money every year. Thanks to Cindy and her team for their diligent work, I've had the incredible privilege of participating in several events at the Children's Hospital, and let me tell you that the passion that they have for what they do is palpable. Thank you to the volunteer board, the doctors, nurses, and medical staff, and everyone that works there, because they appreciate the critical role children's plays in our community and have never, not once, wavered in their commitment to see it succeed. Now, reform of any kind requires incredibly tough conversations. We've seen that with El Paso children's, but we've also seen that in our effort to reform our criminal justice system and the many that have to be engaged to help transform that process. This includes policymakers, judges, prosecutors, law enforcement, public defenders, victim and community advocates, and public health officials. And from these conversations has come a holistic analysis of our community's practices, and not only are the outcomes creating a more equitable system, but the work done over the last four years has positioned El Paso County to be at the forefront of criminal justice reform. Now, you might be wondering why this is important to you. Well, operating a criminal justice and public safety system is incredibly costly. In fact, comprising 57% of the county's total general fund budget. An inefficient system means we aren't being good stewards of our tax dollars, but it's also important in ensuring that we are ethically fulfilling one of our core responsibilities, which is the administration of justice. This year, El Paso County released results of an extensive and groundbreaking recidivism study, which has put El Paso in the spotlight. Ours was the first local study of its kind in the US and revealed a connection between time in jail and a significant increase in rearrest rates in subsequent years. This study now gives us the information necessary to fine tune our justice system to improve public safety and system efficiencies. And adding to that success, El Paso County is on track to become the first local jurisdiction in Texas to validate a pretrial risk assessment, which will greatly enhance the ability for our judges to make sound bond decisions. Now, a program established this year by the District Attorney Jaime Esparza is aimed at diverting those who may need a second chance for committing a low-level offense. Typically, anyone caught with four ounces or less of marijuana would be arrested. 
I said marijuana and everybody looked up so intently. <laughs> now with this first chance program in place, those same individuals, as long as they have no prior criminal record, can be ticketed, pay a fine, and are required to complete supervised community service. In its first nine months alone, the county has seen a $200,000 cost savings, and to date, 73% of the referrals have successfully completed this new program. Now, part of addressing our criminal justice system means ensuring that anyone, regardless of their economic status, are treated equitably. That wasn't always the case. In fact, a 2014 audit by the Texas Indigent Defense Commission raised a number of concerns with the county's indigent defense system. This year, I'm happy to report back that during a follow-up visit, TIDC announced that we were a model for the state and that we were only the second county in Texas since the agency was established to correct all previous findings. And adding to that success, TIDC awarded El Paso County a multi-year grant to establish the Mental Health Litigation and Advocacy Unit in the Public Defender's Office. This will allow for specialized legal representation to be offered in a holistic way to individuals with serious mental and intellectual de developmental challenges. This is in addition to an impressive list of accomplishments and investments in the field of mental health reform with our partners at Emergence Health Network. And again, we haven't done it alone. We've done it together. And it takes an incredible team. Thank you again to the county's elected officials and our department head leadership team, many of whom are here today, and our outstanding star employees who are here as well. We leave here hopeful, gracious for what we have, and excited for what's to come. Mr. Samaniego, you are inheriting an organization that so many, and I can attest to this, have put blood, sweat, and tears into. It's an organization transformed. And I have no doubt that you will help lead us into the next chapter of county government in El Paso. But we must continue to guard our vision. We're heading into a state legislative session where local governments are under attack and already vulnerable communities will continue to be marginalized and mischaracterized. Our federal government will continue to try to divide families, divide our border, and divide each and every one of us. We must continue to find ways to work together and set the example of what the power of community looks like. Now, as I close, I hope that I've piqued your interest in all that's going on at El Paso County. But there's so much more, like our new website, our efforts to offer secure elections, and the purchasing of new elections machines, our work around emergency management, and our efforts to address homelessness with the city of El Paso. We'd be here for months if I kept going. So on that note, roughly two months from now, my time in this position comes to an end. But the impact on me is even greater, given this also ends 11 years of service to El Paso County. And I've been reflecting on my time in this role and realize that while I represent El Paso County government in this position, my life and my family represent who we serve. I was a student where English was a second language and grew up in the unincorporated area of the county. I'm a proud product of public education and the University of Texas at El Paso. My grandparents immigrated in search of a better life, teaching me the importance of two languages, diversity, and my heritage. I'm the son of a man who, at seven years old, worked the onion fields of our community to help provide for his family. My mother, born in Ciudad Juarez, later became a US citizen and represents the beauty of our binational, bicultural community and the strength and resilience that the women of the border exemplify every day. 11 years ago, I'd be hard pressed to tell you what your county government was doing to advance opportunity for folks like me, and for that matter, any one of us. We've gone through a pretty remarkable evolution, and we did it in an effort to advance our shared vision for what we believe every member of our community deserves. Safe neighborhoods, rewarding jobs, great parks, a vibrant downtown, and building on that feeling that when you're in El Paso, you know you belong. Today's message centered on what we can do together and there's so much that we've been able to achieve, and yet there's still so much more that we will do for El Paso. You should be proud of our El Paso County government, just as I am. It has been an honor and a privilege to work on behalf of the community that I love, alongside each of you, tireless and inspiring leaders who have made building a resilient county a labor of love, but never a job. 
Thank you all so very much, and have a fantastic afternoon. I was waiting for the omniscient voice to introduce me, but she didn't do that. <laughs> no, I'm Stefan Postiger. I'm the chairman of the El Paso Chamber, and just want to say thank you uh, to Ruben, his entire staff and team. County Commissioner's Court, uh, thank you for all your support of the El Paso Chamber, especially uh, in the last few years. Uh, you all have really uh, stepped up and joined us at events both inside and outside of El Paso. And, and I can tell you that the county uh, is in good hands when judge-elect uh, Ricardo Samaniego takes over the helm. Uh, this guy has traveled with the chamber uh, to Pittsburgh for our inner city visit this year, and he just got back from uh, D.C. with us uh, for, our uh, for our advocacy trip. Um, so he's fully on board, and we look forward uh, to having him uh, continue to be part of our team uh, at the El Paso Chamber. And I can tell you that advocacy trip uh, to Pittsburgh, our inner city visit, uh, as Ruben spoke about the great work that's happening out at Fabens in collaboration with UTEP, I can tell you that a school by the name of Carnegie Mellon, if you've ever heard of it, is taking great interest in that area as well. So uh, these kinds of trips with our county uh, uh, are very fruitful to the region. Um, also want to take this uh, final chance to thank our great star sponsors. Uh, I won't go over them, but there are table tents uh, at your table and you can view them. They are responsible for all these wonderful state of events uh, and be tuned for a state of the business event next year. Um, this is kind of a bittersweet closing, if you will, for myself. Uh, as chairman of the El Paso Chamber, uh, it's the last official lunch uh, for me that I get to close. So the next 20 minutes, just hang tight. I'm kidding. Um, it's been a great ride, um, and you all should, in fact, be proud of what this chamber has accomplished in just one year. Um, from hiring a new CEO uh, to reorganizing the entire chamber structure, developing a solid brand direction, and ultimately a new name, El Paso Chamber, um, to now uh, starting the process of finding a new home here in downtown, uh, restructuring our bylaws to match how we do business, uh, so many things have happened in just one year, uh, and they are all something that uh, the El Paso Chamber members and you all should be proud of. I know I am, so thank you. Uh, one last thing, this is it. Uh, our gala is Friday, November 2nd. Uh, that's coming in two weeks, if you can believe it. Uh, November's that close. My wife told me today only 10 shopping uh, Fridays left till Christmas. Um, It'll be right here uh, outside, uh, and we'll, re we'll introduce this year's recipients uh, of the Breakthrough Leader Awards, which will be wonderful. Uh, we'll have some great dinner, and we'll cap off the night with uh, some great entertainment. So from the El Paso Chamber, uh, thanks for joining us today at the State of the County. You all have a great rest of the week and day. Goodbye. <laughs>